This is Selma Schimmel for the Group Room at AACR in Chicago, the annual American Association for Cancer Research Meeting. And our content today goes on as we speak with Dr. Susan Domchek from the Abramson Cancer Center at the University of Pennsylvania. In the interesting capacity, you are a medical oncologist with an expertise in cancer genetics. And we're going to talk about a whole new area of exciting development, clinical trials for something called a PARP inhibitor. Mm -hmm. Could you explain a bit about what a PARP inhibitor is and the patient population that is showing right now current benefit? Of course, uh, PARP inhibitors are molecules which inhibit a specific DNA repair pathway. It is called the base excision repair pathway. And in our cells, we have a number of different DNA damage repair pathways. So PARP inhibitors inhibit just one of those. And if you inhibit that repair pathway and everything else in the cell is working all right, uh, not much happens. They're pretty well tolerated drugs. But in certain cancers that don't work well in terms of repairing DNA by other processes, something called homologous DNA repair, then the PARP inhibitor plus the fact that they don't have good repair of DNA by other ways makes the cells essentially blow up, it's something that we call synthetic lethality. So there's a few groups of patients that seem to be particularly sensitive to PARP inhibitors. The one most obvious group is individuals who have a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation. So these are women and men who are born with one bad copy of a BRCA1 or 2 gene and when they lose the second copy, then cancer develops. So these tumors seem to be sensitive to these PARP inhibitor drugs. There's also a lot of interest in using these drugs in individuals who have what we call sporadic cancer. And by sporadic, we mean not specifically associated with a certain gene defect. And these drugs have been studied in individuals with ovarian cancer in general, and also with a specific type of breast cancer called triple negative breast cancer. And there we still have work to do to figure out exactly which groups of, of women within those groups might benefit most, but those are the trials that are ongoing now. PARP is a protein? So PARP is actually, it's a polymerase. So it's a poly ADP ribose polymerase. So it actually, its function is to put things on, a, on target proteins, so it modifies those proteins. Um, and by doing that, it helps in this base excision repair pathway. So by blocking it, you block that pathway. In order for the PARP to be effective, do you also combine it with a chemotherapy? I understand you use alkylating agents to damage the DNA to make the PARP more um, sort of receptive. It's a great question, and it might depend on the population of patients that you're giving the drugs to. It may be that in BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers whose tumors already have a problem with DNA repair, that you might be able to give the drug alone. However, in other situations, potentially triple negative breast cancer, you may have to give the drug with something else that, that causes some of this other type of DNA damage. So again, you get two hits. Um, the idea here is that these PARP inhibitors, for them to work, you need a second hit. And whether you get that second hit just because of how the cell is, or you get that second hit by using an alkylator agent or something like that, um, that's work that we're doing now. So we're looking at the combination approach with PARPs, and we're also looking at single use uh, as a single agent PARP. Correct. So are we also looking now at dosing? Yes, it's a it's a great question. We we. Uh, there are multiple agents that are in development, so that's another exciting aspect is that it's not just one PARP inhibitor, there are many that are being studied. Uh, for some of them, we have a pretty good idea of what the dose should be alone, uh, but we still are working out what the dose should be in combination with other things. Um, because of how these drugs work, when you combine them with chemotherapy, you can have more toxicity, so you have to play around with the dose, and it depends on the schedule, and it depends on what the other drug is. So all of this is, is underway, and we don't have the, the best answers for, uh, for every drug yet, um, but that is the idea that you, uh, you have to check the dose, the schedule, and what you're combining it with to know what the best recipe is. And Dr. Domchek, for, the, for women in, with breast and ovarian and BRCA, BRCA1 and 2 syndromes, how is it that these patients 
fare differently in a positive way in response mm -hmm. to some of these therapies? I've um, been lucky enough on a clinical sense to have as one of my main goals taking care of women with BRCA1 and 2 mutations. And I'll say that at least they get this. <laughs> this, is, this is a little bit of the silver lining in the cloud of, of having one of these gene mutations and it being at such high risk for cancers, is that there is this improved response to chemotherapy. And um, that does seem to be because the cells, if you will, are, are more unstable, so that they are more prone to some of the damage uh, from, um, from the chemotherapy. And that is uh, certainly a, a good thing, but it also means that we have to be very thoughtful about the way that we design clinical trials regarding these agents. So as we learn more and more about the genomics of cancer, mm -hmm. patients that have a genetically, a, a cancer that results from, in this case, a genetic mutation, mm -hmm. the biology of their cancer then must be rather different than the biology of ovarian or breast cancers that aren't <laughs> impacted by the BRCA mutation? Well, I think there's, there's two points w within your point. One is that we can't assume that, for instance, BRCA1 mutation-related breast cancers are the same as triple negative breast cancers. And, and there was a period of time in which that was a little bit implied, maybe not assumed completely, but implied. So we do have to recognize that these are different groups. On the other hand, there very well may be groups within these sporadic ovarian cancer patients or triple negative breast cancers that are very much like BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers. And the challenge for the scientists um, is to figure out what that looks like. What does that cancer look like that's going to respond the same way? What are the predictors of response to these drugs and how can we define that? And that's a really important question. One last curious question. As researchers have begun to identify BRCA mutations in other patient populations. We're most familiar with the Ashkenazi Jewish mm -hmm. patient population, but now uh, Dr. Olapati from mm -hmm. the University of Chicago did her work and discovered a BRCA mutation in African women, mm -hmm. and now we understand uh, Jeffrey Whitesell's mm -hmm. work at City of Hope with uh, uh, Hispanic women. Yes. Do they have the same response to PARP inhibitors? Um, do they share that? in common with their BRCA sisters? We don't know the answer to that yet. The studies have been done lumping sort of BRCA1 mutations together, no matter what type of BRCA1 or 2 mutation. It is, it is assumed to be the case that no matter how you lose BRCA1 or 2, regardless of which type of mutation, we'll probably end up there. Um, but these are these are these, all the this, questions. This all the questions we need to answer. Thank you very very much, Dr. Susan Domchek from the Abramson Cancer Center at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you. Thank you.